Hello and welcome to Movie of the Year 2019. I am your host, Greg, and we are here, everybody, at part one of the finale. When we leave here, when this episode is over, we will have only four movies remaining, and there will just be blood all over the floor. We've absolutely sliced up the movies of 2019. Mike, if I am not wrong, you are joining me now as my best friend and winner of last week's show. Greg, if I'm hearing you correctly, uh, no, I would love to. I think I think you've been making the mistake because you're realizing I'm the better person and I should be your best friend. Uh-huh. But unfortunately, I'm just the best man on this show. No and, one ever uh, fucking said that you weren't the best person. That's not what we're fucking competing <laughs> for. All right, That was never up in the air who was the best person. It's about who won the show and remains the best friend. Also joining us, very loud and very proud, is Ryan. Hello, Ryan. Yeah, he's just hey, a proud up? boy. Mike, when you, uh, when you win one, you can be as loud as you want. This is actually way louder than I want. I wish I could be less <laughs> loud. <laughs> Guys, I have to jump in here, and we have to address the elephant in the room. And it's that this whole 2019 season, I feel like there's just been a movie hanging over it. And now it's really time to pick what is the best movie of the year. Setting aside... Parasite, which I think that a lot of people, from what I've heard, from what I've seen on the internet, are predicting that that is going to be 2019's movie of the year. Setting that aside, what one of these movies might take it down? And let me let me tell the people what the movies are. Let me remind you. Oh, good. It's Paris, Parasite, Uncut Gems, Little Women, The Irishman, Joker, Marriage Story, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and Midsummer. Do any of those movies do you guys think have a chance to sneak in here and take it? Yeah, I would say that there's probably four that can get the fuck out, and I think there might be four that have uh, an, an, a chance of winning. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I will say this, guys. We're doing awards tonight, too. We're giving out the Moody's, um, and I don't know if this means anything because we have some negative awards, and you know, not all awards are created equal, um, but Marriage Story is nominated for eight Moody's tonight. Wow. Wow. Almost every movie is nominated for three or four. Midsommar is five. Cats, Joker, and Us are nominated for two. Cats is nominated for two awards. And the only movie that got zero nominations this year is Pokemon colon Detective Pikachu. <laughs> Proving but that it's worse than Cats. Marriage Story's eight nominations is, it might be a uh, moody record. That's, okay, so that's got to indicate that this movie at least has a chance. And I feel like that's on the short list of movies that could do it right we liked marriage story um we we watched that and did the show way we were different earlier. people yeah this is pre-pandemic stuff the holidays were imagine? there we were giving gifts we were flying everywhere like it didn't matter kissing every stranger on the mouth oh man Somebody- i would get in a plane to fly somewhere and we would all just start making out as soon as possible and do you remember how you would just, like, get up in the morning, you just go to the airport, and you just hop on a flight, yeah. and you wouldn't even know where it was going, but just for the experience? We were all money bags back then, too. Let me just One- tell everybody something, that if you think that there's a chance that you wouldn't look cool when you're trying to kiss, like, 30 or 40 people at the same time, open mouth with tongue, let me show you a couple of videos of me doing it, mm-hmm. and you'll see it's really easy to look cool. Like, you automatically look cool, almost. The sound effects and gifts floating around your head really help. Yes. I'm going to still take a pass on that. Well, I'm not asking you to kiss people. I'm just saying watch the video. You can't get no. COVID from watching a video. Yeah, and I'm going to, again, I'm going to reaffirm, no thank you to watching that video. Okay, what if something unprecedented happens and that video wins 2019's movie of the year? This is unprecedented <laughs> times we're living in. I'm reminded from everybody I've ever interacted with. Okay, you guys, I heard a commercial on the other day, and it referred to these times as super precedented and very certain. Oh. What? Was, that, was that Dunkin' Donuts? Was it Nostradamus.com? <laughs> In these dang old precedented times, where things that we expect to happen, happen all the time. You know the movie that, looking at this list, that I think could sneak in there and fuck everything up? Detective because we're Pikachu. bros. What? Not Detective Pikachu. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Mm. Yeah. This. Oh, cause, not because we're bros like we're friends. You mean because we're fucking idiot, testosterone-filled morons. I, it's specifically because we're three men. I don't mm. think that, like... And I don't no think like I, yeah. <laughs> that She really balances this out. But it's Tarantino, and so that's right up our alley, right? And it is a hyper-masculine movie, and we are hyper-masculine us. men. Also, and then the... 
the flip side of that would be Little Women, right? I think Little Women has a chance to sneak in. Yeah, because we're this. bros. We're hyper masculine. <laughs> it's Gerwig. <laughs> we contain multitudes. Multitudes, yeah. As long as it's super duty or super girly, then yeah, we're going to be down with it. We contain multitudes and ratitudes. When we come back, we are going to get to that first matchup. And we're back. <laughs> we were just enjoying a funny joke off mic, uh, but <laughs> you wouldn't get it. It is time, ladies and gentlemen. Round one, battle one. I can't believe we're already here. <laughs> this always You always feel like it's not going to matter. And then as soon as it, it starts happening, you're like, oh, shit, this is the most important thing I've ever done. Battle one, round one, battle one is Parasite versus Uncut Gems. Come if on. I could just say, if I could just say one thing about Uncut Gems, because I feel like we, sh- we should probably talk about this. Uncut Gems barely made it into the top eight. Uh, it was a split decision, and it would have been Knives Out. Oh, shit. Is there anything anybody wants to say about Knives <laughs> Out real quickly? I can't believe we didn't talk about the movie on this season. Knives Out would have been, I mean, like, it's Ryan Johnson, who we're all defensive about. Um, it's What like, do you mean by that? Because he made the best Star Wars movie of all time, and people that don't That is understand. true. That's uh, a point for next show. <laughs> uh, it's a genre movie, which we none of us think gets enough respect, and it's about how, like, uh, rich people are fucking terrible, mm-hmm. and minorities get the job done. Um, Knives Out could have gone very far. Um Uncut Gems, on the other hand, I'm glad that it made it, you know? Yeah. And I, do you guys have that thing in you, like that, uh, I don't know, that reality TV producer thing where because it just made it, because it just squeaked by, it, we're now entering into Cinderella story territory, and now we want it to go further than maybe even it should? Yeah, I love drama. I love tension. And maybe, maybe it's saying the same thing as Parasite, but better. I didn't feel like I was going to have a heart attack the entire time of Parasite, just most of the time. So... I, I also think it's important that if you're – basically every battle, every movie, are they're saying the exact same things, only different. Mm-hmm. We have to bring up that point because it makes us sound smart. <laughs> they, nobody asks what they're saying, though, because I can't do it. But they're saying the same thing. <laughs> the, the, the most trenchant critique that Uncut Gems makes of capitalism, I, I think, in these times would be that capitalism is a system that must continually move forward and, like, a furnace just constantly be burning stuff or otherwise it can't sustain itself. It's a cancer. And that's, that's the life that Howard lives in, in Uncut Gems, right? He has to constantly be doing more and more stuff and getting bigger and bigger. And the bigger he gets, the more likely there is to be a catastrophic end. And honestly, like, looking at our economy now... The American this is dream, what baby! Ha- yeah, this is what happens when you have an economy that can't slow down even a little bit has to grow exponentially constantly and it's unsustainable and it will only find peace when it gets shot in the head <laughs> by a low-level mafioso well yeah i mean i th- the main thing is that like it since the middle class is gone basically what we have is people who are in the lower class uh that want to get out they have to just be insane and i mean like if you just go through prisons it's probably a lot of people who i uh, didn't know how to get out of being low class and so they did crazy shit in order to see if they could get to upper class this is there is no more like i'm just going to be in the middle i'm going to buy the house and the picket fence it's if you want to be up there which it seems like most of his family is you Mm -hmm. know howard's family is upper upper class then you have to constantly be hustling constantly be moving and cutting corners um uncutting corners that are probably you know ethically and morally shaky yeah do you think howard lives his life by the mantra if you want to be a rock superstar you have to live large and take charge I think so, yes. I mean, that is what his face tattoo says. But I think the Safdie brothers capture it, it feels very genre y. It's not like it, it, describing it like it's this character piece about how capitalism eats at somebody. That could be a very slow movie that only four people saw, but they made it high octane tension the whole time by yeah, still saying pretty grounded. It's not a horror movie, and it's not even necessarily a thriller, but it has so many of those elements that horror and thriller mm-hmm. filmmakers use. With uh, you know, from how the sound works to how the editing works to just the the constant, like the nonstop ratcheting of tension and things going mm-hmm. wrong, and uh, everybody just is in this chase. You know, and, uh, you don't even know what they're chasing for. Maybe it's just love, but everyone is chasing everyone. The jump scares are just every time Howard smiles. You know, something terrible is about to happen because it's never because <laughs> he has a great idea. 
And then at some point they say, all right, Howard, you have not learned your lesson. We have to make you go through every single grade of elementary school, <laughs> middle school, and high school for two weeks each grade. And that's when the movie got – that's why I think the movie's better than Parasite. And then he became a professional golfer for a while, even though he didn't really have, like, the professional golfer demeanor. No, yeah, there's this way that you're supposed to act if you're a professional golfer, and he just refused to act like that. But he did, of course, get in a fight with Bob Barker. Mm-hmm. Who later then said the price is wrong, bitch? And oh, then wait, he, I guess I guess I guess Happy Gilmore said that. And then he got hit in the head and thought he was the son of the devil himself slash nine uh, eleven survivor. That's <laughs> yeah, that's when he was uh, bringing water to football players with Drew Barrymore from The Wedding Singer and Drew Barrymore from Fifty First Date. <laughs> we did it. Well, it's not easy, but we have to do it. Which of these two movies? We'll be moving on. The one that we talked about extensively or the one that I think we mentioned in passing? So it's Parasite versus Uncut Gems. Mike, what do you think moves on? Yeah, congratulations, Uncut Gems. You were talked about in our final almost show. Parasite moves on. Ryan? And we can still bring up Uncut Gems in Never the again. second part of the... Uh, no? Okay. I, I'm hearing that we will not be bringing cinema. that up. How about in our just private conversations, Mike? Can we? Can I'm we, listening no. in and I will tell the board. <laughs> um, I... Th- I like I said, I'm glad that we did Uncut Gems again, but uh, watching it the second time, it sort of made me love parts of it more and made me, you know, I sort of it, it showed the flaws and the holes as well. I don't think it's in the final four. I don't think it just, like, happened to be up against Parasite. Otherwise, no. it would have gone further. I think it's Parasite by a landslide. If I can vote for as many votes as it takes to get a landslide, I would like to do that. Yeah, this was... Fraud. Th- voter fraud. I feel like out of respect to the Safty brothers, who we know are longtime listeners of the show, we didn't re- declare this a slammy D, but it was basically a slam dunk of Parasite over Uncut Gems. When we come back, oh my gosh, it's the real legitimate end of season awards. It's moody time, and we're giving out the first one. And we are back, and it is time for some awards. With our first award, here's Ryan. Thank you so much, Greg. Uh, our first award is we're going to do that thing where in order to keep people watching, we're going to do the biggest, most important one first, yeah. and then we'll go from there. Uh, our first one tonight is Biggest Shithead, and this is a moody staple. Uh, we always explain that um, it's not best villain. No. Okay? That's, anybody could do that. This is the, like, the, who has the most punchable face? Who's just a dickbag for no fucking reason? Who is the shithead of the movie? Yeah, because it's so easy to be like the person who was did the most evil stuff. Mm-hmm. We're not, we don't believe in nor do we care about evil. Yeah, but we fucking hate shitheads. <laughs> it's also, also there's usually like uh, all these extenuating circumstances of why they were evil, whether right. it was abuse or broken yeah. brain or something. Uh, these are people who are just dickheads for no reason. They just suck. They just really suck. Not nominated was Mr. Dashwood from Little Women. Was that because we just love Tracy Letts so much? I think, one, we all do love Tracy Letts, but it's he had such little screen time. All the other shitheads really smiled through their shit through so We're much of their movies. We're out there welcome. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, I had the, the premise of your question, I think, is absolutely right, Ryan. He was also in uh, Ford versus Ferrari this year and probably one of the – or in 2019 – uh, and probably one of the better parts of it. He's just a very good actor, and so even though y- you do kind of want to punch him in the face, he manages to make that charming. Just not enough of a shithead. He also, in real life, uh, locked down Carrie Coon. That is his wife. Wow. And <laughs> I, like, wow. I feel like I'm the biggest shithead for not being married to Carrie Coon. That's what we say about you all the time. Because all of right. your notably <laughs> regular wife. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, your first now I know this is gonna it feels like it's gonna go against the premise of the award, but uh sometimes you could be the villain and the shithead. Your first nominee is McCavity from Cats. This is a perfect example. Like you can be the villain and the shithead mm-hmm. at the same time, but this McCavity has made it his expertise to be I mean, I guess he is he's villainous in some ways, but that's not as apparent at his as his just absolute shitheadedness. Yeah, do you know what's pretty shitty is whispering your name as you kidnap people. <laughs> or whispering how you're doing it magic as you're kidnapping people and nobody has magic and i don't even know if we know that if he has magic he might just be saying it and then people like turn around and then they're like oh where'd he go <laughs> and whatever and puffing down the alleyway 
what is even meant by magic in the cats universe? <laughs> okay, who who else is nominated, Ryan? Your next nominee is Thomas Wayne from Joker. Um, I do think that you might pick up on a uh, rich people are assholes no matter what. Uh huh. Um, but if if Joker is the person we're supposed to be rooting for in the movie Joker, then I guess Thomas Wayne is the shithead. Even if Joker's not the person we're supposed to be rooting for in Joker, watch it. Thomas Wayne's the shithead. <laughs> he really, yeah. They they didn't go so far as to make him villainous, but they made him a huge fucking jerk. Like he just sucks, you know. Which it, I I do think that that's more interesting than this perfect, you know, guy. One who of the good donated it up, Yeah, donated almost all of his money to help Gotham. Especially, still be a shithole. Especially now. I mean, I think there's something very modern about this because we, again, not to see everything through the lens of the pandemic, but by being living through this pandemic, it's very clear the rich people are not going to save us. There's not a Tony Stark. There's not a Bruce mm. Wayne. There's not somebody who's going to just absolutely pour their money into saving us. Maybe Bill Gates, but on the other side, there's like Jeff Bezos, who is ca- like cartoonishly evil. Mm-hmm. As his workers die, he refuses them everything so that he could get up to that one trill trill <laughs> what's up Lex Luthor Mo- motherfucker shaved his head bald and refuses to open both eyes all the way like how much more villainous can you be you burnt Bezos alright so this next nominee is very near and dear to my heart um, my very regular wife and I will watch TV and we'll know that a TV show is ruined forever because motherfucking Kyle Bornheimer is there <laughs> this guy this guy just destroys TV shows, and every single time he comes on screen, she and I both go, Bornheimer! <laughs> Kyle Bornheimer was in Marriage Story. He had two or three lines, but despite that, he's still motherfucking Bornheimer and deserves this nomination. He's Ray Liotta's like, assistant attorney, he, right? Mm-hmm. Right. He's the guy who looks like if uh, Barty Rubble came to life. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was still half a cartoon. He's been on yeah. every sitcom ever. Dude, this guy's IMDb. Like, it really has all of our favorite shows. And if you look, the shows were never the same again. <laughs> he comes and he Bornheimers over all of it, and I hate him. He's on uh, Avenue Five. That yeah, show. I think he's good on it. He's really good on it. He plays just he's like a Bornheimer uh, on it. Yeah, <laughs> he basically <laughs> plays that character. He plays in everything. I thought the insult "cuck" was dumb, and then I watched him in Avenue Five. I was like, no, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, your next nominee is Christian from Midsommar. So Christian's hard because uh, we all know this guy. Like, this is out of all of them. I was like, no, I've met Christians in real life. Like, they're all this fucking chud who... See, you, you mean people that are like the character Christian in the movie mm-hmm, Midsommar, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, good. That, I think, is going to work against him because that's his role in this movie is to be emblematic of, like, the bad men of our time and the way in which they're not actively evil. They're just passively terrible. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I think that, like... We're dealing with rich men and then just, like, kind of, like, toxic men in our biggest shithead list. And one magical cat. <laughs> but, but, so, we know McCavity's not losing that. So, isn't... I feel like that, that makes me hate him even more. Like, that's not... Yeah, like, when, you say, when you say that's bad for him, this is the award where... Does that mean, like, that he's not going to win or he is going to win? Oh, yeah. No, that means he's going to win, right? Because I, I think he's... Christian is a big enough shithead if he just had any compassion for the person he like spends a lot of his life with if he could just open himself up to her a little bit in this movie he and all his friends wouldn't die yeah but be- <laughs> this is a crazy award too because most awards like best actor uh our voting block how uh, legion as they are are like i don't know what good acting is i guess i'll vote for this because that makes sense biggest shithead is so full of opinion about how we think about real life yeah. that <laughs> If you if you know what we're into then or not into then you can predict the winner. I I'm, I'm pretty uh, sure the way we each decide how who we hate most in a in a work of fiction is the person who reminds us most of ourselves. Oh for sure. So Christian might have a real good chance at <laughs> oh, <in> this. No. <laughs> uh, that's why Mike voted for McCavity. <laughs> uh, your final one is another blurring of the villain and the shithead and that is Phil from Uncut Gems. This is Eric Bogosian's henchman mm. who He's got that face the entire movie um, that when what happens at the end of the movie happens, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah. that makes sense. He was telling he, us. He, <laughs> yeah, he was clearly capable of that the entire time. Uncut Gems is a bunch of people who are not really good at what they're doing, all co- sort of thrown together. I mean, Howard really is the, be- is the best at what he does of anybody he comes in contact with. But this guy is obviously like a low-level mafioso. And I was thinking about this just the other day. After what happened at the end of the movie, they obviously don't get away with that. No. 
There's those cameras guys get arrested. everywhere. Yeah, those guys get arrested like a week later because even if they take Howard's cameras, they there's cameras like of of who was in there last. It's there's yeah. probably so much physical evidence. They sweated in that box for an hour. And a dead is they... like, oh yeah, I saw those guys at the play. Like they've been popping up all yeah. over their life for the last three weeks. But it's because they fucking suck too. Like, uh, and uh, Eric Bardozian, he fucking <laughs> he totally sucks. Like nobody is doing a good job in this movie. It's the exact same scene. Uh, so basically, Phil shoots uh, Howard, mm-hmm. and then shoots Eric Bogosian, and now it's just Phil and the other thug there. And then they look at each other and they start breaking everything. Yeah. And it always reminds me of. Uh, Ray, no Roy, and Roy's brother <laughs> yeah. in the bar Where they find after out Jim like kissed Pam. Jim kiss Pam, and so Roy's so upset, and the brother's like, "Hell yeah!" And just starts throw- <laughs> he doesn't even know what's going on, just starts throwing shot glasses. Uh, this is the independent <laughs> film version of that. All right, so your nominees are McCavity, Thomas Kane. I'm sorry, Thomas Wayne, Jeez. Bornheimer, Christian from Midsommar, and Phil from Uncut Gems. And who's it gonna be, Ryan? Mm, the envelope being ripped open. It's Christian from Midsommar. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Was there any other way? <laughs> I think it's crazy, too, because there's a, another more obvious shithead in that movie. Will Poulter, the fucking smartass yeah. with the brows. Yeah. I think that he is more commonly thought of as the shithead. But when it comes to the three of us who hate that guy and are so scared of being that guy, he's going to take the award but down. Poulter <laughs> wears it on his sleeve. The fake yeah. nice guy is the worst shithead ever. Well, congratulations to Christian. <laughs> good, good job. Good job, man. When we come back, we are getting into our next battle. And we're back with our very next battle. This is round one, battle two, Little Women versus the Irish Man. So who's going to win, our Little Women or our Irish Man? <laughs> this is, I mean, you are choosing genders right now, right? Yeah, like This yeah. is the big decision. And it's Which the only it thing that be? matters. Nothing else. And is it going to be young ladies or old men? In the history of America, it's generally been old men. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? I didn't notice. Old men fighting furiously to look like young men. <laughs> uh, I w- for me, this battle boils down to um, Little Women. I'm trying to figure out where each movie landed mm-hmm. because I loved Little Women when I saw it, although I told you two that I thought it was fine because I did not like how much you guys liked it. Uh, this is your way. You guys had such warm, good feelings that it drove me insane. Uh, and then when I watched it again, it some of the joy got unsparked. Just a little bit of it. Like, it, it moved down a little bit. Whereas Irishman, I would say it went from a three-star, this is good because I think I have to say it's good, to the second time I was like, holy shit, this is a masterpiece. This belongs in the Scorsese Hall of Fame. They both may have landed at the same place. But because it feels like one jumped and the other one lowered, it's hard for me to, like, figure it out. How awesome is that if you're Greta Gerwig, though? Like, you, you're like, this is maybe, like, upper tier Scorsese. Yeah. And yeah. it's as good as Greta Gerwig, Little Women. Like, damn, have you ever it's arrived, Greta Gerwig? Her second or third film? Yeah. So, <laughs> fuck, man. Well, yeah, I mean, it's unfair. She already had that. She already had Lady Bird to practice on. So, Little Women probably should have been better then. <laughs> She already made Mike, one other great film. The second time you saw Little Women, Mike, did did it did it move up in your esteem or down? Because Ryan said he liked it maybe slightly less. Yeah, I think it moved up because uh, the second time I was more analytical. The first time it was just like a wash of joy uh-huh. and color. And so later I was like, I loved it. Surely that means it can't be great. Great movies you're supposed <laughs> to suffer through. Uh, and then I watched it again and went, no. I fucking like it even more. And now I can like point out specific reasons and performances and shots and Gerwig as a director. Uh, so, yeah, it, it moved up in my esteem. Because that's interesting because that I expected that to happen with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we we have, like, completed the whole thing because, Ryan, you liked it maybe slightly less. Mike, you liked it more. I liked it the same, which uh, almost felt like liking it a little bit less because I guess I expected when I saw it the second time I was going to like it. I was going to be like you, Mike, like it even more. And instead, I was like, yeah, dude, that's that, that, that's that movie. It's really, really good. And, you know, I loved it and I had a good time with it. But I was surprised that I wasn't like – a lot of times if I like a movie a lot, the second time I see it, I'm like, holy shit, that was even way better than I thought it was. And to not get that, to only feel like I liked it as much, I don't know. It, I, it has the impression of like a step backwards or something. 
I gave it four stars out of four, and then it just stayed at four stars out yeah. of four. What, what is, is going on here? Break my scale. And but going, I have going through the show with you guys, I sort of realized what I mean by it going down, and it was like in 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 the Irishman. You can see all the work, and with Little Women, it's like this is too easy. Yeah. She's too good at this. It's just her natural talent. Like, uh, the reason that I'm, I'm crying right now is because she spent all this time developing the characters. That's unfair. Boo. Like, why would I be crying? <laughs> and and it, it's funny. So, like, I think one going down, one going up, but both being four stars is like a hokey way to land on who wins. But so is uh, where Scorsese comes. Yeah, you made a great film. Fuck you. That's what you do. Oh, great. Scorsese <laughs> made another great film. Who gives a shit? Where Gerwig's like, oh fuck. I knew she could make good stuff, but I didn't know that. Like, the expectation is so different. I I don't dislike The Irishman, but I feel like I don't like it as much as like pop culture does. I mean, it's like ninety seven on Rotten Tomatoes. It's like was on everybody's end of the year list. Ryan, you say it's like it's one of the best movies of two thousand nineteen. I just never got there with it, and I think it's a couple reasons. One, that is too long for me. But we don't have to re-legislate that. And the other one is, I feel like Al Pacino's performance is just so bonkers. And I, I thought everybody felt that way. But after the show, I got the sense that you guys were like, this is a normalish performance. But it felt so over the top and so weird so much of the time to me. The, I, I felt like he, his, him playing normal characters has been more over the top. And this, it felt <laughs> like Jimmy Hoffa was always... In a performance. Okay, that's a good point. Like, that's a good he, point. Yeah, he, like, in his head, he woke up and he's like, I gotta hop it up today. This is what yeah. people want. And, like, grown, like, being on the East Coast and hanging out with my dad's friends, I've met Hoffa's, and I was like, you're fake as fuck. But it's like, this is what the people need because we got nothing else. <laughs> uh, so it felt very true to life. Just a lot of, at the end of every sentence, just grabbing their balls as hard as they can. Ah! <laughs> yeah. Um, I, like... The amount that it moved up for me was, like, really shocking to me. Just because I, when I watch a movie for the first time, I really watch it so good uh-huh. that uh, it, I was surprised. And I, I know this isn't, like... When you perfect. watch a movie, it knows it's been watched. <laughs> it's like, yeah. It comments on me. It, it gives me pull quotes <laughs> on how I watched it. Um, but I know this isn't, like, perfect movie criticism, but I've been, uh, like, trying to get information from people who thought it was okay and who thought it was great. And I think the big difference that I think the people who think it's great are sort of left cold by Scorsese's DiCaprio era mm-hmm. and have Raging Bull, Goodfellas, and Casino memorized. And I think that this again, that's not that doesn't prove that it's a good movie. I just think that there's it's it's both because this is what we're used to and what we like, but it also is this cap that we needed, that we didn't know we needed. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you're more about the Leo era and you don't know Goodfellas and Casino that well, then you don't, why would you need a cap? You don't give a shit. Who cares? This is, this, this is just old men as opposed to this perfect finale, you know? Well, I think we're there, everybody. I think it's time. I mean, there's no losers here, right? One of these steps forward. The other one is it's a, a loser. fucking loser. Is a, is fucking, a fucking loser. loser. What a f- Could you but imagine at this point you just lose? You got this far. I'd rather not be in it at all. This is crazy. Why, why didn't you just win? I there would were, just make a better film. I think there were uh, like 750 or 800 movies eligible mm-hmm. for Booty 2019. And you got to here, and then you've lost. Yeah, like what? Like what metal would you get? Like iron? Like aluminum? Aluminum? Rebar? Oof. Well, anyways, that's the ignominious end awaiting one of these movies right now. Ryan, which do you think should move on, Little Women or The Irishman? I have to be true to myself, and I I, I have to go with The Irishman. Fuck off, Mike. What do you think should move on, Little Women or Irishman? I have to be true to myself. Little Women gets my vote. And I'm the tiebreaker, and of course, it's Little Women. Um, Congratulations, Little Women. Goodbye, the Irishman. Maybe we will live to regret this. But on the other hand, we may die at any moment. When we come back, we are doing another award, and it's for Best Violence. I should have tied that into the segue better. Next time, I will. And we are back, and it's time to give out another award. Ryan, I'm going to throw this to you. What is the award? I sort of set up the audience to already know what the award is, but act like I didn't. What what's the uh, award, Ryan? Okay, so what Greg one of the one of the words that Greg did not say in the last segment was best violence, and that's what this award is. This is uh this should be an award. This is uh, a time where we saw like blood and guts and shit and we Not were only like, is this an award, 
but it should be an award. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like at the Oscars. I mean, like at real, <laughs> at real things. <laughs> Um, where uh, we just this is what we got the most titillated by when watching people kill people. This is America, oh. right, baby? Oh. Not nominated is Robert De Niro kicking the shit out of the grocer at the beginning of The Irishman. That's and bullshit. I, you know, I love a green grocer. The only thing I love more than a green grocer is a green grocer getting got. I I want to I, I want to ask you guys: Is that just proof of how seriously we take these awards? Because what a what a hilarious joke it would have been for that to win best violence of 2019. Dude, straight up, like violence is one of the most important parts of a movie, and I'm not gonna hit, give an award to something that does bad violence. A lot of these movies, like we, we have another award we give out, best sex, and a lot of times because this is America, we're like scraping the bottom of the barrel. This is technically sex; it was in the movie, but with violence. You've got, like, a huge group of contenders for violence, and you can't just give it to something that doesn't deserve it, like an old man trying to beat up a slightly younger man. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, the, it's the kind of joke where, sure, it's hilarious in the moment, but 50, 60 years from now, when we're telling our grand, yes. great-grandchildren about the Moody Awards, we have, to, like, we have to, like, come to terms with that moment. This is going to be in the Library of Congress, you guys. Like, we they can't mess around. Violence. <laughs> They're the uh, only ones who can authorize it legally. Your first actual nominee is Charlie Punches the Wall from the film Marriage Story. <laughs> it's kind of funny having that on the heels of what we just said. <laughs> but that's – so we're used to cinematic violence, right, where it's cool and titillating. This is the one where I, I made a face and groans from titillating. This is horrific because this is real violence. This is what people see and yeah. some people will roll their eyes at. But somebody doing that is gross and disturbing and not fun when you're in the room. I guarantee you everybody has a family member who decided that the screaming was not enough and – they just went for the drywall. And it's it's something that, like, it is affecting because if they had pulled two guns out of their suit coat and slow motion flew around with doves on, you'd uh -huh. be like, I'm used to that. I see that shit all the time. But uh, going from a screaming argument to punching through drywall, you're like, oh, shit, this just got real. <laughs> and it is such a, a crisis point in the argument that he basically collapses after that and, like, is like a little boy on his knees, like, just holding onto, onto her legs. And, and yeah, it's he wants forgiveness for that yeah. but also he doesn't want it to ruin any of the other great points he was making before <laughs> that and you can tell adam driver is really acting there because if real adam driver punched that wall like his whole arm would go through it <laughs> and if he hit a stud probably the building would come down <laughs> yeah, he would lift him. his arm up and the entire apartment building would come up with his arm <laughs> but yeah i think it deserves to be nominated your next nominee is uh, we know what's about to happen and yet it still takes 20 minutes for this uh, old, presumably married couple to dive off a cliff. One dies immediately. The other does not, which means that people from the crowd have to take a giant uh, Swedish Mjolnir and bash the fucking head in from Midsommar. Yeah. Uh, if we're just going by what affected us. What really had, and this is like when we were talking about this award. This is what I was thinking about. Like, I this is my least favorite part of this movie. It's awful, um, but it's supposed to be, and it's supposed to really like be like you're getting hit in the head with something, mm -hmm. and it's very effective in that way. Yeah, it really. With you guys, with, with neither one of you guys having seen Hereditary before Midsommar, was this was this like the scene that you most expected? Like, was this the kind of shit that you were expecting? I, yeah. And that's what, what makes this scene so good is I'm expecting this at some point, but the way it happened, not so much. Cause you're like, uh, okay, they're going to, they're going to jump off a ghost. And then ruining both my favorite stand up comedian and my favorite carnival game. They just go on those heads <laughs> with the giant mallet. Like it's <laughs> a fucking watermelon. <laughs> that's why they gave the Colt in the front row, all those ponchos. Uh -huh. And you're like, Oh, this makes sense. Now. I was confused before. I've seen in so many movies uh, bodies getting smashed and blown up and then people that were around it, like, spitting shit out of their mouth. Like, you ever put together that that's human that yeah. they're spitting out? Sculpt that is it. not oh. – that's not, like, a little bit of dirt or something. That's oh. gross human. All right, Ryan, what else is nominated? I don't – like, that nominee has all the parts of violence. That's everything that's great about violence. I don't see how it can't not win. Uh, the next one is Cliff versus the Manton Kids in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. <laughs> oh, if this were like one of our iconic awards, you know, like if this were a Rushmore or something, this is going to be the most like the most I iconic violence mm -hmm. of 2019, I think. It, and this is like Tarantino represents all the things America loves about violence because he's just like, what if it's only fun? Let's not think about consequences at all. It's delightful. Oh, also, like the, this, this entire movie is like this bowstring of tension slowly mm -hmm. being drawn back. 
And then when you realize something different is going to happen, you're like, oh, I guess there's not going to be a violent thing. And then it's still hyper violent, <laughs> yeah. but it's the way it's violence acting in service of you, you feel like, rather than violence being done against you. And going on that journey, like, this is like Tarantino's whole career has been about violence. And this is, I think, like, such an awesome exclamation point on all of that. Because you go from, like, oh, God, here comes this awful violence to, like, yes, violence. <laughs> I need <Damn>. it. <laughs> and it's over the top and terrible and awful and cartoonish. Yeah. It's just like it's like everything all at once. On the episode that we did about Hollywood, we talked about specifically what happens to the girls in this scene. Um, but now it's the award for best violence. So does that still come into play when you're like rooting for a winner? Talking about how Brad Pitt, our, the, our greatest star, is just destroying the heads of women. Yeah, yeah. baby! Okay, but this is the best violence award, so does that still matter? And then he's also suspected of, like, killing his wife. Uh, Cliff is. Not Brad Pitt. Not Brad Pitt, no. Okay. Your next nominee, guys, we just talked about two scenes that were, like, 12 minutes long each. Uh Uh-huh. Your next nominee is two seconds, and yet it got nominated. Um, The housekeeper from Parasite is coming up the stairs. (laughs) Mrs. Kim sees that that's happening. And gives her one kick, and she falls all the way down the stairs and bashes her head. Also, the funniest and most gruesome combo. Like, it does both of those things that you want out of violence so well, where you laugh and then feel horrible for laughing because this real person has a real concussion. It's very true, yeah. Like, I mean, it, it is, in just two seconds, it's kind of got that same feeling that the Once Upon a Time in Hollywood violence had, which is you celebrate it. And then in the same act of celebrating it, you're like, ooh, I don't know. Actually, this is like, you can't kick somebody downstairs. That's what you realize. Like, it's so cool when it happens, and it's funny. And then a second later, you're like, oh, wait. If someone falls downstairs like that, they'd probably die. Stairs are you fucked have, up. You have to figure out a way to kick people upstairs. Yeah. That's the <laughs> only way that it works. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's, cra- it's So much of this, too, is sound effect. Like, yeah. it's, it's, it's a hilarious pratfall. Like, it is... Looney Tunes level, or to speak Mike's language, it is Gallagher level. Thank but uh, <laughs> at the end, her head smashes that wall. Yeah. yeah, it gets smashy. Real smashy. What next, Ryan? Your final nominee. This one is, uh, so we've had a lot of, like, we get to see incredible directors directing violence incredibly. Um, but sometimes it's really just about the surprise and what it means for the story and the character. Um, Howard get shot in the face. And I hope that everybody sees Uncut Gems without hearing what I'm saying right now. Because um, if you don't know that's coming, it is crazy. Yeah. And it's not It's not shot like John Woo. It's not a Fast and Furious movie. He takes a bullet to the face, yeah. and that is the violence. And it's like, I will never get those frames out of my head. You know, like, I can replay that anytime I want, and I do. <laughs> <laughs> it, and it's very similar to Once Upon a Time on Hollywood, except you're not expecting it. You're expecting it just based on the music and the way Howard lives his life. So you think it's going to happen throughout the film. But he's gotten away with it so long that you don't expect those darn kids to actually shoot him. You're like, no, no, Howard will win. He'll finally. And then he gets shot. You're like, oh, the thing I thought was going to happen that I thought was definitely not going to happen did happen. It's a roller coaster. I, I think this is why it was incredible casting. Like, we all know that Adam Sandler has hidden talents underneath his Adam Sandler characters. But the other thing, too, if you're playing on his past characters is that they will be awful and annoying, but we will somehow come out rooting for them because mm-hmm. they always get the girl yeah. and win the day. And when you think about it, this is what should happen to every Adam Sandler character in every movie. And it's interesting because I kind of saw it coming. Like, oh, no matter what, this guy, like, Howard is I did not. in trouble. And, but what I think is interesting is because, like, you said you didn't, Ryan. And so it's like it works for you on that level. But knowing that it was going to come, it's still shot in such a way where it's still rewarding for that, too. You know, like, I, it, 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 it is as abrupt and crazy even when you kind of see it coming. I think it's also t- important to point out that the Safdie brothers made sure that he is definitely dead. Mm-hmm. There was no, like, skin oh, yeah. off my ear. You yeah. know, there was no, like, oh, it hit, uh, it hit a police badge in my pocket that I was given by my dad when I was a kid. He's fucking dead. You know what I, I weirdly think about with this all the time? I think about that part in Hamlet where Hamlet's going to go kill his uncle. And uh, Claudius, his uncle, is praying. And so he's like, well, I can't kill him now because he can't go straight to heaven. So I'll just wait a little bit. <laughs> when I when I think of Howard being shot in the head, he went straight to heaven. Like, he's yeah. in the middle of his orgasmic bliss, and he dies. He goes straight to heaven, dude. And that's why they go into the cut, and it's like the, the celestial view. He, like, 
he in his moment of utmost bliss, he ceases but, to exist. So yeah, it's I guess I feel bad for Julia Fox and his children and like what they have to go through. But Howard won, yeah. right? He guaranteed he would win, and then he won. So th- I guess that means uh, Jules is single now. I guess so, Greg. <laughs> ready, ready to mingle. Let's get to the important stuff. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, th- let's not blow the award of who Greg should date from the 2019 <laughs> movies. Uh, so your nominees are Charlie Punches the Wall from Marriage Story. Uh, the, couple, the couple jumps off the clip from Midsommar. Cliff versus the Manson kids. Oh, it should have been Cliff versus the old couple. Uh, Cliff versus <laughs> the Manson kids from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Mrs. Kim kicks the housekeeper down the stairs from Parasite. And Howard gets shot in the face from Uncut Gems. And the winner is? And your winner is Cliff versus the Manson kids. I think that like if it if if your scene's gonna be this long, that's a good way to win. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. When we come back, we are going to be doing our next matchup. And we are back. Our next battle, round one, battle three, Joker versus marriage story. Guys. Marriage story I moves am, on. I am calling. Let's go. <laughs> Mike, you took the steam out of my oh, whole I'm sorry. thing. I was really building up to a whole thing where I did it. You go, thing. you go, you go. For, Can for anybody it. think? But honestly, Mike, I think I know your answer. Can anyone think of a compelling reason not to just flush this? I mean, it's if Marriage Story gets trounced in the next round, then we're going to talk about it a lot. So there's no reason to talk about it here. Um, I think that the more we were pretty negative on Joker, yeah. and the more time that goes on since we recorded that show, I get like less and less positive about it. I think <laughs> yeah, that, I think it's a really bad movie. Um, I think that we all landed on like neutral, like too too dumb to hate. Yeah, and I think that I'm starting to hate it. Um, whereas Marriage Story, uh, I've got a thing for this director. I don't know if you've heard. Uh, I yeah, let's move on. Marriage Story. All right, congratulations to Marriage Story. You are moving on to the next round. Joker. Bye bye. When we come back, we're giving out the award for best sex, and we're back. Now, we're three gentlemen who know a thing or two about S-E-X. We feel com- I've had it. We feel comfortable discussing it, and we understand what it is. Ryan, what are the nominees? Was it a good... First of all, I, <laughs> I thought you were going to ask him what sex was. Ryan, what is sex, <laughs> and am I doing it right now? I, one thing I, I have to ask right at the, the outset, Ryan, is because I have noticed in the history of this award, there are, so, there are usually not even enough things that technically like even fit in the ballpark. Was there a, a bumper crop of sex in 2019? No, I like. I think it's in part because the the later that we go, or the more recent that we go, the less there's going to be available. Like, if we start doing movie of the year 80s, we're going to have a shit ton. But it, I I don't know if it's because we got more prude and we got more classy. I don't know if it's because the top eight movies of the year don't have it, but the others do. Or I don't know if it's because uh, once once we could have access to Pornhub at all times like there really wasn't that need to get it from the movies that you went to go see you know but um, but it all adds is, up to like very little sexual there's nothing content. sexy like in order to fill out the the bracket or the the voting thing that we fill out like i have to think about your guys's fetishes like uh-huh. we do beverly hills cop and eddie murphy puts that banana into the tailpipe of the car and that's mike's favorite thing oh, so yeah. now that's a nominee <laughs> it it's hard to do and you're gonna see by these nominees um, not nominated is when Mr. Mime in the interrogation scene, he uh, unfolds his legs and then recrosses them, and we see Mr. Mime's vagina, just uh, like in Basic yeah. Instinct. His mime gina? His mime gina, yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't like this. <laughs> <laughs> this segment is now being done under protest. <laughs> so that was not nominated, but it did have a vagina. You got, you, you <laughs> just guys, sit and think about that. You guys both you, both of you want to move on so bad. I think I just want to talk about this for like another minute or two. It's, it's a weird thing to put in a kids movie. It really is. It's a weird reference. I was thinking about this the other day with uh, there was like a Domino's commercial where a guy is in the house alone back when that used to be a thing you could do, and uh, he like has the just a just a collared shirt on, just sunglasses, and slides into a room in his underwear and socks. And I I got thinking like everybody is familiar with that image nobody has seen Risky Business. No, no yeah. And most people who could tell you that that image comes from a movie has no idea that Risky Business is about a high school student who starts a brothel while his parents are out of town. Like, it's so weird how these things can last longer 
and mm. th- this basic instinct they're making allusion to a movie that came out in like 93 Mm. Uh, and was known for its sexual content. But, like, kids obviously don't know what Basic Instinct is. And most adults probably haven't actually seen it. But we all know the leg-crossing thing, because Newman was so into it. For some reason, uh, I was talking to my wife about the movie Rear Window. I asked if she saw it, and she was like, "Uh, 100%. I've seen it start to finish. Never a second of the Hitchcock (laughs) film. But, like, she really, in her brain, can put together every single minute of the movie and spit it out. (laughs) All right. You guys ready for these nominees? Yes. Okay, so we're done with Mr. Mime and his vagina. Ryan, please we never say be. any of that stuff ever again. Your first nominee, and I don't know if this tells you how bad of a year it was for sex or how great a year. It's Taylor Swift coming down on that moon <laughs> in from the movie Cats. This is not a time where we as a show covered ourselves in glory. I think we usually do a pretty good job of not acting like three creepy dudes. <laughs> and for whatever reason, the cats thing was able to like slip through the cracks. If you are a Patreon listener, you can check yeah. out our, our cats episode. And we hold it together for the entire 2019 season. And then for whatever reason, Taylor Swift as a cat really just kind of made us lose our cool. Yeah, I, I think it's that uh, Cats was so boring and uninteresting that her coming down surprised us, and so we, we unloaded in a way we don't. And you know what? That's just, just, just for patrons, and you got to pay for the perv. I, I mean, the best part of our Cats episode is us for, like, an entire hour saying, do they, do they think this is sexy? Do they think that, like, <laughs> are they trying to get us to want to have sex? And then the last 30 minutes is like, I want to have sex with those cats. <laughs> for me, it had a lot to do with the fact that they took they took Idris Elba and they like made him scrawny and I'll never forgive them for that. But they took Taylor Swift and they made her curvy. Oh yeah. I love and my curvy cat. That, yeah, that just surprised me and I didn't expect it. And I was in a weird place, <laughs> but yeah, I think that this is, there's a reason this made it into the, for the, the nominations. Your next Ryan, nominee what is next. Your next nominee. And, um, I feel go, like even that. though we have the winner already. I mean, that's fine. I guess it's fine. <laughs> Sometimes alphabetical order works in a way where the winner comes up first. I can't do anything about it. Um, your next nominee is you have to admit that genitals are sexy, which means that the hair around genitals are sexy. So your next nominee for best sex is Christian gets a pube in his drink from Midsommar. No, look, I, I, I have no problem with pubes in life, uh, yeah. but but disassociated and unattached and in your drink or in your chicken pot pie. No, no. No. Not sexy? No. Not sexy. No. Mm-mm. Yeah, pubes, sexy as hell, natural. <laughs> that's a, that's that's real life, gentlemen. But removed, yeah, from their natural atmosphere and then placed into a pie that is Mm-mm. being used to bewitch you Mm-mm. so that you can be, like, killed. Mm, too much. What about, the, what about the no that said, I want to bewitch you? That was pretty <laughs> good, though. Your next nominee has a little bit more to do with sex. Uh, it's when Christian is having sex with that girl who is missing a pube in the movie Midsommar. And you can really see yeah, that she's see. missing a pew. It's odd. <laughs> <laughs> it's got that little red bump right there, like she's getting a rash. This, I feel like we have to, he said this on the other show, but I feel like we have to say it again. This is Ari Aster doing that thing where he's like going to like freak you out by making you just look at middle-aged naked bodies. The natural bodies but, of older people. Yeah, and uh, it is really so offensive in this scene where it's just like, can you imagine having to look at a slightly overweight older woman naked? It's like, yeah, she looks freaking great, dude. What are you talking about? Yeah, the the, the grosser thing uh, that gets distracted by him being dumb is uh, they're all breathing in unison, and it's freaky as hell, and I don't want any of that. It's not sexy <laughs> sex. Yeah, there's one part where the older lady comes down and like uh, just is sort of like being supportive, like mm. uh, touches her head and says, you guys are doing a good job, and he's like, ew. No, She's what naked. I want is somebody to punch me in the face and say you're disgusting for doing this. That's that's what I need to say. All right. So do you see how like Mike makes this award hard, not the <laughs> nominees? Uh, your next one is consensual, non-drugged, non-rapey sex, and that is Mr. and Mrs. Park fuck on the couch in Parasite. Lots of nipple see, twisting here. Even this, I feel weird about this scene because I think that there's a lot that's hot about it. But even this, we can't just like... We can't just have nice sex. Like, they don't just, like, put that in a movie. It's It has to be, like, so horrifying because you know that there's a family basically stuck right there. There's a family under the table. And then also she is preoccupied with her son being in danger yeah. for being in their, like, their nice backyard. The family under the table isn't the grossest part. It's that they're staring towards their son's teepee. Yeah. That's what's the grossest then, part. And then she says, go get those cheap panties. 
Give me all yeah, your drugs. And then, <laughs> yeah, also playing out the weird thing where they decided that their like their driver had a thing where he drugged women and had sex in the car, and so then they play that out. Mm-hmm. Hmm. It's not. Oh, I okay. Just... I see you guys haven't been married very long then. Uh, <laughs> you'll get there. But I gotta say, also kind of hot. <laughs> <laughs> your final nominee is uh, Jules, Julia Fox, texting Howard sexy pics while she's on the couch and he's, unbeknownst to her, in the closet right next to her. And again, this is going back to Greg. We can't just have nice things. If he was in the car or is at his home. Uh, not lying to her. Next to his wife. <laughs> uh, not lying to her and just getting those pictures for sure clean. But him being in the closet makes it all much creepier. He, it he, really is a weird scene. He has this idea where I want to do both things. And I think this is all parts of being a husband. It's just that he's combining them. Of I want to see her sexy and I want to scare the shit out of her. <laughs> you have to do those at separate times. And he combines them. But uh, Julia Fox, very, very attractive actress and really sells this scene. But it always feels like it's on the verge of like something really disturbing happening. And Mm -hmm. then it's like, but I think it goes to show you, it's a good scene for also setting up their relationship because they're always doing these really weird, performative, dramatic things like hiding and lying. And and it's like, it's what makes them work, I guess, as a couple. That's why you have a long-term affair, right? Like, it's to get all like that gross, weird shit out. So yeah, if you're just like acting like normal people, what's the fucking point? Yeah, you're already married. Why do that? I think the disturbing part is that even when it's not a happy Madison production, even when he's not like in a typical Adam Sandler movie, there will still be a girl that's way out of his league that chases him around and wants to have sex with him. (laughs) All right. What is the winner, Ryan? So your nominees are Taylor Swift from Cats. Christian gets a pube from Midsommar. (laughs) Christian has sex with a girl who's missing a pube in Midsommar. Mr. and Mrs. Park fuck on the couch in Parasite. And Julia sends – Jules sends Howard picks while he's in the closet. And your winner is – and I don't know what this speaks to, but your winner is Uncut Gems. I think that it speaks to the fact that Julia Fox is an attractive actress that I didn't even know about her until this movie. Uh, but apparently she's like a she's like an Instagram. She's an influencer, right? Maybe. I or don't know. I know she's New had a York- crazy life, um, like sex work and a lot of stuff that led her to this place here. I think that. Believe like part of our vote was as as like as hot as Julia Fox is. Part of our vote was this is the most normal thing yeah, we could vote for. The rest is creeptastic, and it give us maybe in the next season of this show we will have some just like normal people regular regular sex. Like that is a thing. It is part of human life. And is it, it just like <laughs> some slow saxophone, diaphanous curtains, just classic eighties sex? <laughs> or just how about the the uh, rich? parasite couple but they're just in their bed Mm -hmm. and nobody else is in the room with them (laughs) and in love and not role-playing as their employees who they fired and they're getting off on fire being fired in like dirty underwear and i don't know Um, maybe it's that one thing where like good movies just don't have sex so like we're never going to talk about any of those movies i guess we got our eyes wide shut that was an entire movie sort of like investigating sex or using sex as a way to investigate life and those movies honestly everyone remembers them as sex movies because that's how rare it is to have a movie deal with sex in like a normal way. S- sex is okay and normal, everybody. Let's let's try, let's try to embrace that. Or the way that we fucked up is we didn't nominate Mr. Mime and his vagina because that would have taken the whole thing down. Not engaging when we come <laughs> back. Our last matchup of the first round, and we're back with our last round one battle. This is round one, battle four. It's once upon a time in Hollywood. Versus Midsommar. Guys, is this kind of close to a slam dunk? I don't want to be rude to Midsommar. It's our guest. <laughs> and has, like, Is there any chance? And is the winner of a Moody tonight. Like, they're already walking away with biggest shithead. So <laughs> congratulations to them. <laughs> or did they know they got the biggest award? They're like, fuck, we're not going to go on then. Let's just get out of here. Uh, yeah, because, you know, like, if you're not going to get something the mm-hmm. best picture, then you give them some... Uh, offhanded award. I think that these are two overly long, kind of sloppy movies. I think that they're these movies you have to either you, like you are not going to declare perfection with either of these movies. Mm-hmm. It's the one whose flaws you appreciate the most, and I think that I uh, like Hollywood's flaws are still enjoyable. And you know, big Tarantino head and blah blah blah. Whereas Midsommar 
the second time you're watching it, the third, the fourth, the fifth, it's like, come on, bud. Like, you, you, you had too much success with Hereditary, and you tried to do too much on this one, and let's scale back a little bit. I like the movie. Still too much. Is it a case of a little too much? Oh, once you're past that first viewing. I, I get what you're trying to do, and it's not, there's not as many levels as you think there are. Yeah, because well, what, what I want to see is I want to learn more in those things that seem unnecessary. Yeah. But instead, they just sort of seem unnecessary. What, once Upon a Time in Hollywood, it pre- presents like a really complicated picture, and you're kind of chewing on that for a long time. Midsommar, there's a complicated picture, but the more you look at it, the more you're like, wait, none of this really kind of adds up to make any sort of sense. Like, there's not a coherent message here. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of, like, the beginnings of messages, and then it they don't quite land and i I guess a few of them do land like i think it pulls off like what a cult is and how it works and how it makes you feel you know Mm -hmm. that that it's 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 beautiful and warm in one way while it's still brutal and cold and violent in another and how that's not how how the like desperation for acceptance and empathy like how powerful that is and when you're with somebody like christian how how much you can start to need it yeah and i loved some of the stabs the movie made at like presenting the Hagar or whatever they're called people as like normal in their own way. Mm -hmm. Like they are like training the next generation on what to do and they are trying to build a better life for themselves. And uh, they do make people feel accepted and loved and they're all together all the time and everything like that. But those are kind of interesting points, but it just doesn't, there's so many little aborted attempts to say something, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, about culture and about the way cultures interact. And it, it, it feels like, he got to the end of it and it was like he tried to say so many different things and he's like i'm gonna leave the rest to them to just sort of figure out because that's what that's dots. what good filmmakers do right just <laughs> leave the rest of them i and do so the more you think about it the less like coherent it seems yeah the, the normally the leave the rest of them is you put so much in there and are saying for real so many things that people are like oh fuck i can chew on this forever instead of like hmm a lot of a lot of bright colors not much sustenance I've- on our Midsommar show, like, if it's a great movie, then the three of us come in knowing for a fact what it was about and what it was telling us, and then the three of us scream at each other about how we're right. But this mm-hmm. was like, I think it was this, and then the other two were like, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> it's a rough matchup, too, because they're both, they actually are both, uh, like, two hours of hangout movie. Yeah. Yeah. And then 30 minutes of, what the holy fuck? Yeah, and for sure. You. Ari, Ast- Ari Aster is not at the point where he can go up against Quentin Tarantino in that situation of mm-hmm. two hours of a hangout movie and then just crazy violence. Well, I think it's time to call to a vote. I mean, I'm glad I saw Midsummer, right? Like, I mean, I, I it was something I was not eager to see. I mean, then I watched it. I think that you proved so much to me and Mike. Like, we, <laughs> we now think that you're capable of anything after you doing that. And I thought that it had a lot of really interesting ideas, the hyperabundance, the daytime stuff, like the having basically all the characters on the screen almost all the time, like just in the background doing things or, or whatever. Um, I, I It was really effective. But is there any chance that it can take on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? Mike, what do you say? No. I, I thoroughly enjoyed Midsommar, but Once Upon a Time in Hollywood takes it. Ryan? Yeah, I like, I'm very excited for Ari Aster's third movie. Much, yeah. like, much like with Greta Gerwig. Maybe she can finally make a watchable movie. He did such an amazing job with Hereditary, then kind of had a sophomore slump. Maybe he'll come back and like apply what worked in the first and didn't quite work in the second and put together something truly beautiful for the third. Well, probably not beautiful. Right? <laughs> well, it beautiful be in its own way. While. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so our movies that are moving on are Parasite, Little Women, Marriage Story, and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. That's your final four. This is what we all thought, right? Is anybody yeah, surprised I, by this? No, I, I thought Irishman was in, was going to be in the final four, but yeah, this all tracks. I'm not. If I got to have more votes, like I had suggested, yeah, it's that would work. <laughs> that was a good suggestion that you get extra votes, Ryan. So that is the end of this round. That is the end of this show. Before we go, Mike, tell the people about websites they can go to. Please go if you enjoyed this to yourpopfilter.com. Everything we do lives there. And if you're like, no, I can't support you directly enough in that website. I need a website where I could give you money. Hey, friends, we got your back. That's at patreon.com slash yourpopfilter. You give us some money, and everything that we make that doesn't go to yourpopfilter.com does go to that website. Very neat. And we're we're starting in OnlyFans. Is that correct? Am I Mm -hmm. correct about that? Mm -hmm. It's going to be mostly (laughs) shots of Mr. Mime. It's it's, (laughs) There's basically just, just one tier, and it's the tier where you get to not see us naked. 
and my wife is very excited to sign up for that one. <laughs> uh, our music is done by Shady Monk. Thank you, Shady Monk. You can look him up on Bandcamp or SoundCloud. Or as you're driving down the road, you can just stick your head out of your moonroof and shout out Shady Monk. And he will be driving by on a scooter next to you. On social medias, at Your Pop Filter on Twitter, at Your Pop Filter on Instagram. Or if you want to email us, contacts at Your Pop Filter. If you have a suggestion like uh, Ryan should have more votes, then email that and that'll go right into the suggestion box. Yeah. Uh, That's what we call the trash can. Oh, Mike, you got there first. You got there first, big guy. You got there first. I put Ryan should have more votes in the suggestion box, but I did not sign it. Did that, like, anonymity, did that, like, help it go? Or did you guys know who put that in there? Well, because they all got sent from Ryan at your prop filter. (laughs) Yeah, so you didn't sign it, but you didn't need to. (laughs) It it became pretty clear. Our other shows are the OCD. That's where Ryan and Mike decide to take a little no Greg time Uh and do some talking about the OC. By the way, OCD, or the OC, had an episode dedicated to Risky Business recently and i do think that all of the fans then and all the fans now like you said greg have no idea what they were referencing the (laughs) entire time honestly like if you're listening to this at home which you should be uh go watch risky business and tell me if you were prepared for anything that happens in that movie (laughs) the the time when he slides in on his socks you'll be like yep i remember that check i guarantee there are like 10 bonkers things in that movie that you had no idea happened in any movie let alone the movie that we celebrate (laughs) every time we watch a domino's commercial That is the end of the show, everybody. That is the end of round one. Next week, we are going to be doing finale part two, and we will have for you 2019 movie of the year. Tune in next week, but until then, keep on watching the movies.